Now we pray that, pray that was a, a blessing to you. We're going to be this evening in the book of Romans, if you have your Bibles there, Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 14. And we've been looking the last, well, a couple months now, uh, through the book of Romans, been studying about how we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone, and that our salvation is not of us. There is nothing we can do worthy of being saved. There's nothing we can do to deserve being saved. Uh, to stop sinning will not save you. Uh, but also we look at how faith alone, faith without works is dead, the Bible says. So while faith alone saves you, faith also produces a work in you. It, it shows us the fruit. The Bible uses the word fruits of our salvation. In other words, when God saves you, the Bible says he begins to do a work in you through the working of his Holy Spirit. And because of that, it changes the things you do. And we're going to be in the book of Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 14. And the Bible says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now Paul is the writer here, and Paul has been talking about the salvation to, for the Israelites. And as he does, when we looked at our last section on Wednesday night, we see that that righteousness is fully by faith in Christ. And the problem that Israel has is they do not believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. They believe him as a great teacher. They believe in him as, as, a, as a good prophet. But they don't see him as Savior. They don't see him as Messiah. You can have, believe in Jesus as a good man. You can put Christmas tree, celebrate Easter, whatever. But if you haven't fully trusted, placed your faith in Jesus Christ outside of a saving faith in Christ, there is no way of receiving salvation. And the Bible will talk about how that salvation comes to be. First off, you have to have a preacher. In other words, someone who, who proclaims the truth of the gospel. And that person must be called by God. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but a preacher is the only office in the New Testament church that is called by God. It's biblical. When the Bible talked about deacons in the book of Acts, the Bible says that the church was to select deacons to select certain men of certain characteristics to be deacons didn't say god called them to be deacons it says the church selected them to be deacons based on their qualifications to serve the people they were they were basically the the, the, the ministers the disciples did not have time to, to deal with helping the widows and taking care of the poor and doing these things because they were trying to devote themselves to prayer and to God's word. And because of that, they selected deacons for this position. Now, that doesn't mean that the deacons had a point of authority. And sometimes we get that wrong in, in, in our modern Appalachian churches. The deacons were not meant to have authority necessarily. Well, they didn't necessarily they weren't meant to have authority. They were meant to serve. Deacons are servants. And same thing with Sunday school teachers, same thing with whatever position it is. Those are positions that are appointed by the church based on the qualifications of the individual. If someone steps into the office of an elder or minister, that is an office must be called by God. And without having the working of the Holy Spirit, that man of God cannot do what he has been called to do. A person could be the best motivational speaker under heaven and earth and be a horrible, horrible, horrible preacher. Because you don't necessarily have to be the most elegant speaker, the most intelligent man to be the best preacher. You have to be called by God. And sometimes the biggest problem we have in churches today is we have too many people that are mommy, daddy called and not God called. If God is not put on your heart to preach, you don't need to do it. And there's no shame in that. I know some great men who stepped out in faith and they walked into ministry and then they felt, didn't feel the calling of God there and they, they stepped away saying it wasn't their place and that was the best thing they could do because to continue in that position and not be called by God is only hampering the work of the Holy Spirit. Now these people, now we are not called to be preachers because we are, have some special qual quality about us. Justin Bayston in himself has nothing to offer God. In fact, I have less to offer God than a lot of people he didn't call. And my feeling about that is he uses me 
in my weakness, in my frailty, in my false, in my, my ways that I fall short, to glorify Him. Because the only reason I can stand here and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ is because the Holy Spirit working through me. Anyone that knew me before I was called would tell you. When I was in class in college, I would just soon take an F as get in front of a group of people and talk. And even today, if I'm not talking about God, I have a really hard time being backward. But something happens when I step behind a pulpit with a Bible that the Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way and my mouth opens and things just flow. Not because of me, but because of God. And because He has called me to preach, because He's called men of God to preach, and He sends them out into the world for a primary purpose, now, hold on, I'm going to throw away some traditions here. It's going to bother a lot of people, but it's truthful. The primary purpose of the preacher is not to come to the sick beds. It's not to do visitation. Those are all fine things to do, but it's not the primary job of the preacher. That's the Christian's job to do. It's not to do funerals. It's not to do weddings. We do those things as a Christian service. But that's not the primary job. The Bible shows us in the book of Acts that they were dedicating themselves to the prayer and the ministering of God's Word. The two primary jobs of every pastor, every call of God preacher, is to pray and to minister to God's Word. The primary job of the pastor, which is separate from preacher, because there's different types of preachers. You've got evangelists, you've got pastors, different positions. The primary job of the pastor or the elder is to oversee God's church. What that means is we operate in a way to make sure that God's church stays in the bounds of the Bible. That doesn't mean that we're bosses, not by any way. But we do what we need to do to keep order in God's church and make sure that it is inside, it is operating under the uh, qualifications God gives us in His Word. In this time period we are in, even, under the qualifications that are needed to make sure we keep the congregation safe. So God calls us, He sends us out to preach the gospel. And when we preach the gospel to people, the Holy Spirit uses the gospel to save souls. Now that's pretty awesome. Because God in His awesome sovereignty, His awesome mercy and grace, and His awesome glory takes wretched creatures. And here's the thing. Pastors are not spiritual superheroes. I have as many sin problems as anyone else. I got as many battles as anyone else. I, I have times that I fall short. I, I, I have so many issues. I am no better than any other Christian out there. But God takes us in our frailty and uses us to proclaim this awesome truth. And it is the only truth out there that can save a soul from hell. Now think about that. Quit sinning doesn't save a soul from hell. If I go to you and see that you're unsaved and you have a problem with alcohol, I say, hey, you need to quit drinking. That, won't, that will never save you. Telling you that abortion is wrong will never save you. These things may be truths, but they're not going to save you. It is the fact that you are a sinner and that Jesus Christ died to save you. That he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, went to the cross of Calvary, paid the price for the sins of all mankind, and was rose from the grave the third day for your justification. That you believe on him, you will not perish. God will forgive you and give you everlasting life. That's the gospel. That is the what saves souls. That is our job to proclaim to the masses. And then when we tell them that, they have a choice. Whether to believe it and receive it, or reject it and walk away. Now, every, every sermon ever, ever preached is a sermon calling for a decision. And you sitting there listening today, and every other time we've ever done this, will make a decision at the end of this message. Whether you believe and receive, or reject and walk away. Now, if you believe and receive, you can be saved and born again. You can be set free and redeemed. But if you re reject and walk away, you're going to reject the way no, you're going to walk away no better than what you came. You receive 
nothing from this. And there's a lot of confusion there about the, sir, the, the scripture there that Paul quotes when he says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring tidings of good things. This does not mean that preachers literally all have pretty feet. Not so. Feet are disgusting. I don't care what anybody wants to say. Feet are disgusting things. But what it is saying is that when we, when, when preachers are, that come and are true call of God men, they should be people of peace, people of hope, people of joy, people of glad tidings. We have the best, the best promise, the best product ever offered, and it's free. And we want to give it away to people. It's salvation. So people should be happy when they see us coming. It should not be a burden. We should not be a burden on others. Because we are proclaiming the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But while Paul tells us this is the way to receive faith in Jesus Christ and be saved, he gives a very sobering reply in verse 16. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So there's plenty of people who hear the word of God, who hear the message, that will not receive it. They will not obey the gospel. You know, the scary part is when we look at the Bible, it gives us the measurements of heaven. In other words, heaven's bounds, its size is set. But we're told that hell enlarges its borders daily because of the folks who, by their own free will choosing, decide to go there. Based on the rejection of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about two pathways. The broad way and the narrow way. So straight is the way and narrow is the gate. And that's the way that we see that leads to eternal life. The way that leads life everlasting. But the Bible says very few find that path. More people go the broad way. You know why? It's easy. I don't know about you, but I, there, there's a few times in my life I had to pull a trailer through a narrow, little narrow hill road with a gate. And as I approached that gate, I'd have to wiggle that truck and I had the hardest time getting through that trailer and that truck through the gate. But when I'm on these big old broad like coal haul roads and I'm taking a truck and a trailer down, I could just floor it and go. It's easy. See, too many people today are plowing down the broad way in life. Too many people are living in disobedience to the gospel. And you cannot call yourself a Christian and live in open disobedience. It is against the Bible. The Bible tells us that when we are saved and born again, that God will perform a work in us. And by doing so, he brings us to a place of repentance. Again, that's not perfection. I don't want you to lose your assurance. Because let's flip back for just a second to what we, we went over last week, Romans 10. It tells us that thou shalt confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. That's it. That's salvation. Let's not add to or take from that. What I'm saying is the Holy Spirit should be working in your life, and if he's working in your life, you need to submit to him. You need to submit to him. We have too many Christians today that try to live in disobedience and be not submissive to God. And submission, we look at the word submissive is, is such a bad word in, in modern America. Because we want to be strong and in our own person. Submission doesn't mean servanthood. It doesn't mean slavery. Submission means I accept that God is authority. And I'm going to submit my life to Him. I, whatever He desires me, I want to do. Because He has authority over me. And I know what he says is best for me. And because I will live in submission to him. But that submission doesn't save you. Obeying the gospel saves you. So let's, let's, let's look. What does obeying the gospel mean? Obeying the gospel is saving faith. is not you doing your part in response to God doing his part. That's synergism. That, that's not salvation. Salvation, saving faith can only come through the gospel. Salvation is God's work alone. Let's review. God called the man. God enabled the man to preach. God sent the man to preach the gospel. God gave the man the gospel. 
God uses the gospel message through the working of the Holy Spirit to affect you and call you to a relationship with Him. It's all God. And God gives you faith when you heard the preached word. Well, how are we justified? We're justified by faith. Where does our faith come from? It comes from God. The Bible says that He is the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, He starts our faith when we hear the preaching of His Word, and then He ends our, he's our continuation, our completion of our faith when we go into glory into His presence at death or through the rapture. The questions asked about these Israelites in verse 18. Because but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are not my that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. What Moses is saying is God was got so fed up with Israel, he's going to operate in Roman jealousy. You know, if you ever want a kid to desire something, you give it to another kid. Because when they see the other kid enjoy it, they're going to say, oh, i got to have that no matter what it is. When I want Drew or, or Sonny to take their medicine, I'll take and pretend that I'm taking it and tell them how good it is, try to make them jealous, make them want what I have. Well, God was operating with Israel the same way. It, it, he knew that if Israel was going to reject him as they rejected him about every other year. And because he knew the rejection, he sent the gospel out to the Gentiles and began to deal with them and to bring them into a saving faith. So the very ones that were seeking God did not receive God because they sought Him the wrong way. They tried to get to Him the wrong way through their own self-righteous acts. But the Gentiles, who had no desire for God, He gave faith through the preaching of His Word through the salvation of His Son, Jesus Christ. Where do we come involved in all that? Nowhere. We're bystanders. It's all we are. Again, the only thing we provide for our salvation is the sins that we commit that make it necessary for us to receive it. You will never make a decision for Christ until He has made a decision for you. You will never seek God until He has sought you. It all goes back to God. Verse 20 says, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found in them that sought me not. I was made manifest in them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient, gainsaying people. Who are those people that he's stretching his hands out to? They're the Israelites. But I don't know about you, but I look at the whole world and we're all disobedient and gainsaying people. We are all people who deserve to go to hell. We're all people who deserve condemnation. We're all people who deserve nothing good. The blessings of God, we don't deserve a one of them. I don't care if you're even saved. You don't deserve God's blessing. The reason you receive God's blessing is because of what you have received in Jesus Christ. And what you have received in Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. Well, why did you receive the righteousnesses of God? Because in yourself you had no righteousness. You couldn't be righteous because you don't deserve righteousness. We are all filthy, wretched creatures. We say it time and time again. But yet God, operating in grace and mercy, sent His only begotten Son, born of a virgin, to die on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for the sins of you and I. That when a preacher delivers the word of God, we hear it and accept it by faith that is given to us by the working of God, we have a saving relationship with God. How do we believe? We believe because we've heard the word. How do we hear the word? A preacher has preached it to us. The gospel of good tidings. The gospel of peace. And we receive salvation. Before we end this, tonight, I want to concentrate on that word there, salvation. What does that mean? Well, salvation is to be saved from something. What are we being saved from? We're being saved from the penalty of our sin. First off, we're saved spiritually from it. In other words, we deserve the wrath of God. The wrath of God abides on us until the moment we come to faith in Jesus Christ and become a child of God. Up until that point, the wrath of God is, is going to cross hairs upon us. 
because he is angry because we live in rebellion and disobedience to him. And if you are willing to avoid the, the, the wrath of God, and when I say wrath of God, I don't mean he's going to give you a little chastisement and say, ought not do that. I mean, he is going to pour his wrath upon the earth the way the book, the book of Revelation spells out, and you will be crushed under the weight of it. The Bible talks about people climbing in caves and praying for the earth to collapse upon them. All because they spent their life rejecting God. Now they've witnessed his glory at his second coming. I pray that's not you this evening. But salvation not only saves us from our guilt and our penalty of sin, but the Christian is also saved from the habit and dominion of sin. While we're living here, if you're a Christian and you're living in unrepentant sin, you're choosing to do that. It's truth. God gave us a way to escape it. And because of you living in unrepentant sin, you've damaged your relationship with God. doesn't mean you've lost your relationship. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you are saved eternally. But what that does mean is because of the sinful life you're living, you have placed yourself into a place of chastisement and God has removed his blessings from your life but as an act of obedience against you. Folks, I don't know about you, but I want to have a good, strong, intimate relationship with God. And finally, when the Lord returns, Christians will be saved from all the physical results of sin. We will receive a glorified body where we will not need medications, hospitals, doctors, pharmacists, or funeral homes any longer because God is going to make us perfect as He is when we go to be with Him eternally. How do we receive this? I, mean, I don't know about you. Why would you not want that? And as I said with every preached message, we're called to a point where we must make a decision. Well, this is this point in the message. I told you how you receive Christ. You receive Him by faith. I told you how you get that faith. You hear the Word of God preached. You just heard that. Now the question is, what will you do with that? Will you believe and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or will you reject it and go out and deny him? The choice is yours this evening. But I want you to know there's a real heaven to gain and a real, a real hell to escape. The hell was not created for man to go to. In fact, hell was created as a prison for the devil and the, the third of the angels of heaven who chose to rebel against Christ. But because of our rejection of Christ, we go there. I'm very thankful tonight that I can say from my own personal self that I know I don't have to worry about hell. Because I know that God saved me. By His marvelous grace, through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, He saved me. If you want that this evening, all you need to do is place your faith in Him. Fully trust Him, as the old song sings. Fully trust Him. And if you trust Him and call on His name and for salvation... Asking God to save you, believing in His Son Jesus Christ to pay the price for your sins, you could be saved too. And as we close out in prayer this evening, I want to encourage you to do that right where you are. If you're unsaved, place your faith in Jesus Christ and ask God to deliver you from your sins. Let's bow our heads. Most kind, gracious, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your message this evening, Lord. We thank you for your grace, your love. And your mercy. We thank you for all the many blessings you've given us, Lord. Your watch, care, and protection, Lord. And we pray, Lord, this thing for all those that may be listening, that they would call upon your name, Lord. Repent and turn to you, Lord, in faith, and be saved from their sins, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you give them assurance of your salvation, Lord, and let them know that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for, for Jesus and the payment for, his, for our sins, Lord. Pray that you forgive us for we sin and fall short, Lord, and watch over us and help us serve you, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in this evening. If you have any questions, comments, if you feel like God has saved you this evening, we encourage you to uh, call us or send us a message. Let us know um, what God is doing in your life. Um, tune in be with us Wednesday night as we continue to look at Romans. Uh, thank you. God bless you and have a wonderful night.